so thank you all so much oh brilliant recording in progress that's what we like to hear <laughs> um so thank you all so much for coming along this morning or this afternoon or this evening depending on what time it is with you um i have the absolute pleasure of introducing celine morin um, who is a wellness consultant, a dietitian and nutritionist, and she has done some absolutely fantastic sessions for us so far. Some of you might recognize her as well. Um, but today it's all going, going to be all about, you know, different techniques to help us with, with reducing stress and also building resilience um, in the workplace and also in our well-being lives as well. So I will pass the floor over to Celine and I hope you get as much from this session as the rest of us have so far in our sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And hello to everyone that's here live and to anybody that's watching the recording really welcome and i know what a commitment it takes to actually show up and carve out time from your diary because there's so many other responsibilities and things and long to-do lists and other things that you could be doing that could be distracting you so i would like to give you full permission to gift yourself the presence of being present because we will finish on time and this will be um, not just a theoretical well-being journey. It's going to be more of an adventure than a journey because I want you to actually try some of the techniques. And I know that when we're distracted and maybe have multiple screens open, it can be harder to get the full benefit from being present. And right at the end, I'm going to ask you, what is one thing that you're going to take and make a personal pledge to yourself to actually bring into your lifestyle? So you don't need to change more than one thing. There's going to be many things that maybe come up that percolate that you think, gosh, I could do more of that, could do less of that. I could do a little bit of that. I can tweak that. However, when we try and do too much, it can be overwhelming. And I think most of us already are perhaps feeling a little overwhelmed, at least at times. So I'd like you to really choose one thing. And that's why it's helpful if you're really present. Your intuition will tell you what that one thing is going to be. And uh, the good news is, is that we're in this together. And if we really want to create not just an internal culture of conviviality and collaboration and passion, but also live that ourselves outside in our own personal lives, that it's really, it's not that difficult. The big thing is that what I see is that common knowledge is not common practice. And so we're also going to talk about how do we take this theory, these all these good things that we know are good for us that help us optimize our energy and our performance and our sense of joie de vivre and conviviality, and how do we really put it into practice? Because that's really where we get the impact, right? So I'm going to share some slides simply because it makes it easier if you're not just looking at me and I can get across some, some concepts. So maybe, uh, Phoebe, if you can't see the slide, you can always let me know, but you should see one slide that says performance chemistry. And that has a heart with a bit of a fingerprint in it. And there's a really special reason why I chose that. Because each of us, when it comes to our hearts, thank you for the thumbs up, and our nervous systems and our bodies, we have a very unique blueprint. And some things that I'm gonna share with you, we know work generally for all humans. However, the more you can find out about yourself and your uniqueness, the better. And I'm also going to share with you how you can actually do that. What kind of easily available tests are around, how asking the right questions or simply cultivating curiosity. So if you stay curious, you keep a growth mindset and you make it easier to come across solutions and opportunities that you may not have thought about. And when we talk about performance and our internal chemistry, uh, my strategy or my outcome for today is that you have a strategy that can help you own the title CEO. Now, what I mean by CEO is Chief Energy Officer, because if you can mobilize and move energy on demand, you can almost do anything. That's a wonderful superpower to have as a human, right? And when we have lots of energy, when we're able to perform, we feel like we can move mountains. It's when our energy is drained, physically, mentally, emotionally, even spiritually, that we can feel like everything maybe feels like a mountain, even when it isn't. So I hope that some of that has caught your attention. That's a bit of my plan, but this is not just about me. So at any time, feel free to pop a comment into the chat. In fact, I'm going to open up the chat so that I've got it right here. Or a question, and I will get back to it. 
Also, you are welcome to contact me after today. I will share my contact details. They'll be in this presentation and I'll share them um, because I really want to ensure that you feel as if maybe after today, this is enough. Like you feel like, great, I've got enough tools to really build on my performance and my energy and my well-being. But maybe you have more questions and I don't want you to feel like you're alone. So thanks to Pernod Ricard and the GTR team. They really want you to feel supported as we go through this incredible journey. You know, it's a bit like driving a long distance. We don't know what's going to happen on the way. You know, there can be traffic jams and there could be potholes in the road. There can be diversions. Someone can swerve in front of you. You don't know what the other drivers and things are going to do and what's going to happen. So there's a lot we can't control. What we can control is how we respond to all those things going around us. So when you are perhaps driving, if you have driven recently, uh, you can choose to like squeeze the steering wheel, clench your teeth, frown, get up tight if maybe you're running late or somebody drives a bit strangely. Or you can choose to stay relaxed, loosen your muscles, keep breathing deeply and sustain some of your energy. So when you get to your destination, you actually feel good as opposed to feeling bad. <laughs> and when it comes to well-being, there actually is no destination. We don't arrive. So even myself, I mean, I'm perceived as the expert because I'm here speaking, but actually the more I do this work, the more I realize I don't know and how different we all are and how curiosity is so important. That's why it's one of my um, key personal attributes and values. Uh, so this is a journey. We always have to think about how am I looking about my well-being? And we've all come through a really, really really challenging time, a time that our generation has never experienced. So there is, a, there definitely is a collective fatigue, a collective exhaustion, a collective stress, a collective trauma. And yes, we can learn a lot about ourselves when we go through difficult times. When we're in them, it can be very difficult. It's often when we've had the gift of coming through and we look back. However, we haven't completely come through. Things are not quite, you know, I guess normal. And what is normal anyway? Uh, so what I want to start off with is acknowledging that we've been through an incredibly difficult time. It's a bit like we've had a natural disaster outside and we're still trying to clean up the mess inside, but there could still be some more natural disasters happening. So very important to understand that it's all right for you not to be feeling all right, that some days you may wake up feeling amazing and other days you may feel lonely, you may feel sad, you may feel despair, you may feel grief, you may feel anger. And all of us are going through those cycles. So, you know, there, there's something called the post-pandemic flux syndrome, which is really a mouthful. But what it is, is psychologists and behavioral specialists are seeing that after everything we've been through the past 18 months, almost two years, that we're tired. We're exhausted, we're depleted. Some of us have got burnout. Burnout is a spectrum, right? So you can have phenomenal emotional and spiritual and mental fatigue, or maybe just a little bit of physical fatigue. But most of us are experiencing it. And all of this uncertainty that's been gnawing at us for so long is it makes it difficult for us to relax. It keeps us in the stress response. What do I mean by the stress response? When you perceive something that might be stressful, so let's say, I don't know, a wild cat had to come at you. I remember as a young girl, I grew up in South Africa. I was born in South Africa, so my accent is South African. Even though my parents are from France, they went to South Africa on honeymoon and I was born nine years later. They, they've had a very long honeymoon. It's been 53 years. <laughs> They're still in South Africa. But I used to go to safari parks and my parents used to love driving and looking at our animals, especially the elephants. However, my dad would often get a bit too close to take photographs. And more than once, we have been chased by very angry, upset elephants. Now, if you're chased by a wild animal, like an elephant, you go into the stress response. And I remember it clearly, you know, your brain will say, I'm in danger. The message goes to your adrenal glands. They're little, they're the size of walnuts. They sit on top of your kidneys, on your lower back. In fact, if you want to, put your hands on your lower back and give them a little bit of love because my gosh, have they worked hard over the, the last 18 months. Those little adrenal glands release adrenaline and cortisol and many other hormones that prepare us to deal with stress. 
They prepare you to be able to move towards the stress. So maybe you choose to fight and attack, let's say the wild animal, or to be able to run away from it and to hide. Today, many of us are not having the opportunity to be chased by elephants or wild cats, but we are chased by things like teams not working, or double booked meetings, or arguments with loved ones, or thoughts, a, a worry about financial security, or a social media post that's upsetting, or a loved one that maybe gets sick. So all these other things that might come and cause you to feel a little bit of uncertainty or stress, uh, cause the same reaction in your body. You get that flood of adrenaline and cortisol. And what happens is when we're in that stress response, the fight or flight response, we spend much more time in what we call the sympathetic pathway of the nervous system. This is a little bit of biology for those of you that might be interested in the science. I find it fascinating. That means it's almost like you've got the accelerator. You know, you're driving your car, this vehicle, this body, and you're constantly on the go, accelerating, 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 which is why it makes it so hard to relax and sleep at night. For some of us or to switch off because we're constantly switched on. What we need more of is the opportunity to move away from this accelerated high heart rate of fight or flight and move more into what we call relaxation, rest and digest. That's where we allow the nervous system to heal, to boost our immunity, to digest our food properly. Because when you've been chased by a wild animal, it's not that important for you to digest your breakfast. And so a lot of blood flow moves away from your digestive system and all your internal organs to your arms and your legs to help you to run away. But most we're not running away. We're staying in front of our screens and all that tension is getting built up. So let's start off with a practical exercise that can help you to feel a little bit more relaxed, bring some curiosity and awareness to how you may be feeling right now. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to, I'm going to invite you, I'm gonna set my timer. I'll tell you when I start for one minute and I'll tell you when one minute is up. And what I invite you to do is bring your awareness to your breath and notice how many breaths are you taking over the minute. So one inhale and one exhale is one breath. So how many breath cycles are you taking over the next 60 seconds? I hope that you're, if you are, if anybody is driving, please be careful if you do this, do not close your eyes. But those of you that can, it might be helpful to soften your gaze so that you're not distracted. And uh, maybe close your eyes if you're comfortable to do so. And um, I'll let you know when one minute is up, starting in three, two, one. Bring your awareness to your breath and count how many breath cycles you take over the next 60 seconds. And if your mind wanders, that's okay. It's what it's meant to do. Without judgment or criticism, gently bring it back. Back to my voice. Perhaps back to counting your breath. And there's nothing to change. There's no way to be. Simply notice your breath. And if you'd like to count your breath cycles. There we go. That's that's one minute. If you're able to, I'm curious, can you share in the chat how many breath cycles you took over that 60 seconds? If you're able to pop that into the chat. Ah, oh, six and seven and eight. Look at those single digits. That's amazing. <laughs> Anybody else? 12. So why did we do this exercise? 13. Why we did this exercise is because when we are stressed, the first part of the nervous system that gets affected is the breath. So, <laughs> 19, I like the emoticon. It's all right, it's all right. You're in the right place at the right time. I'm gonna tell you what the guideline is, what you should strive for. Um, but that's wonderful information. So the first part of the nervous system that gets affected and your body is your breath. Your breath will become faster and more shallow. 
and it happens so quickly that we don't even know consciously that something's upset us. You can be walking somewhere, maybe it's quite late at night, you're walking in the center of, I don't know, Shanghai, Hong, Hong Kong, London, wherever you might find yourself. And your body will know before your conscious mind does that maybe you're in a dodgy area and, and already your nervous system will be preparing you to be able to run away or to attack. So if you stay aware of your breath, you constantly stay aware of your nervous system. And the guideline is that if we're taking slow, deep breaths, so let's say about six to eight breath cycles in a minute. So that is per minute. I'm just popping that into the chat. It is very difficult for your body to spiral into the stress response. How's that for good news? So even if you're taking 19 breaths, you don't want to aim for six because you'll probably pass out straight. <laughs> but if you're breathing anything more than, say, 10 breath cycles in a minute, you're probably taking faster, more shallow breaths. So the invitation is, and what's helpful is to place one of your hands around where your belly button is or somewhere over your belly, because that helps direct your attention to that part of your body. And as you breathe in, to try and push your hand away from your back. So you actually open up your belly, create a bit of a Buddha belly, the opposite of what society or social media says we need to look like, which says pull in your stomach, which is really not good for using our full lung capacity. So that's a great place to start, is over the next hour that we're together, because I'm gonna ask you to check in with your breath again, is to breathe a little bit deeper on the inhale breathing deeper into your belly, so using up more of your lung capacity. And as you exhale, instead of just is to lengthen your exhale, even by one second. So that's the first tip I wanted to share with you. This mindful minute, if this is something that you bring into your routine, is that every now and again, maybe starting with once a day when you boil the kettle in the morning or as you stop for lunch or as you boot up your computer, is do a 60 second check in with your breath and then notice perhaps if you're taking over 10 breath cycles in a minute, could you perhaps slow down your breath? And that will have huge benefits on your nervous system and help you be more mindful and present. And we're gonna to touch on mindfulness in a moment and how that helps us avoid a lot of this energy drain. We lose lots of energy when we stay tense and in the stress response. So when we talk about well-being and the stress response, we're talking about our body, right? We have this physical body at that, you know, we've got our physical fitness, we've got how we eat, our digestive system, we've got our health numbers like our cholesterol and our blood pressure. We've also got our heart, which are emotional well-being. It's our sense of emotions, being able to know what we're feeling, being able to articulate it, being able to feel empathy and to manage stress because stress impacts the heart very quickly and significantly. We also have our intellectual well-being. So this mind, this brain, this universe that sits on our shoulders. And that means that's our ability to think and problem solve and keep a big picture thinking, to keep a sense of conviviality and a sense of humor, even when there's maybe chaos going on around us. And then we also have a sense of spirit. Uh, I sometimes call this meaning. It's our sense of meaning and purpose. So this is, I guess, your reason why. Why do you do what you do? What's important to you? What are your personal values? Do you feel like you're part of something bigger, part of a community? Do you belong? Do you give back? So those for me encompass my approach to well-being. There's other things like environmental well-being, financial well-being, but we're not going to look at those today. We're going to look at these four. And specifically, because we don't have the whole week together, I'd love to run a retreat with you all for a week. What I'd like to do is focus on what I think is the most important, the fundamentals around physical well-being. So how strong is your body? Are you really your own chief energy officer? Because it's very difficult to optimize your emotional and your mental well-being if you, for instance, are sleep deprived and dehydrated. So we're going to look at the basics. Are you doing the basics around physical well-being? And as I've already shared with you, a technique that can help your emotional well-being, the mindful minute, and your mind, I'm going to share one or two tips around that. And when we've got all of those things in place, then it makes it so much easier to have energy for the sense of belonging and purpose and giving back and being kind to others. 
Now, this, uh, this pyramid of well-being really makes me think of how I grew up. Now, I grew up in South Africa, but as I mentioned, with French parents. And my parents, well, my whole family, they're all from the Champagne region in France. So you can imagine, I grew up with a lo lot of Champagne around me. And my parents would stack Champagne glasses. All my big milestones like birthdays and anniversaries and get-togethers, you can see in the photographs, we've got these champagne glasses stacked together in a tower and then you know you pour the champagne in the top glass and then it overflows and fills the others. Why would I be telling you about champagne? Two reasons. Champagne for me, whether you drink champagne or not, generally if you see people drinking a sparkling drink, you normally assume that they are celebrating. So champagne for me symbolizes celebration, positivity, gratitude, joy of life. And I believe that we should try and find champagne moments every day, not wait for the birthdays and anniversaries. So important to find that sense of celebration in the simple things around life. Then the second reason why I'm showing you this picture is because I want you to feel like you are that top glass and you are overflowing and you are effervescent. Effervescent for yourself and to be able to fill up those around you when they need it. So I'm hope and and what's important is that what makes a sparkling drink effervescent and sparkling is many different small millions of bubbles, not one big thing. So it's the small things that we do consistently that make the biggest difference. That's why this can actually be easier. Uh, and that's what I'm going to help you with at the end, is how do you simplify what we're going to talk about to put it into practice in your life so that you can be effervescent, overflowing, and have space for conviviality and celebration and joie de vivre in the small things, no matter what might be happening around you. I'm not suggesting that we never feel sad. In fact, it's really important to feel all the range of emotions because what we suppress, the body will express. So if you suppress anger and frustration and despair and grief and loss, you can create illness and dis-ease or disease. So very important to express them. It's how we express them, right? That's important. Yeah. Let's look at, at how we can better manage our emotions by looking at your physical well-being. And to do that, I'd like to journey through the Wellculator. Now, the Wellculator is exactly what it says. It's a calculator of how well you potentially are. We're going to look at 10 different areas. So there's a wide range. It's going to be a fast trip because I want us to get to the end and for you to be able to score yourself on the calculator. So you will have a score out of 10 and to have some insight into what you're doing great. So high five where you could potentially be improving and maybe where you have some blind spots where you didn't even realize, hey, I could be doing that to help my performance, my effervescence, my conviviality, my well-being. The first four have got to do with nutrition and diet. So as a dietitian, that's my area of passion and expertise. And also because I'm French, I just love food. I really believe that food can be very powerful medicine. So my question to you. Do you have a strategy around the way that you eat? Have you got a refueling strategy that helps to manage your energy and your, and your health? This is what I often come across. A lot of us are getting up in the morning and maybe because we've been awake between 3 and 5 a.m., we're tired, so we hit the snooze button. So by the time we get going, we're rushing. We maybe have coffee first thing, something quick if we're leaving the house or maybe we don't even eat if we're working from home with all this hybrid working it can be quite difficult to find routine we have back-to-back -back meetings so we don't really stop we might have back-to-back -back cups of coffee when we finally eat something for lunch we don't really stop we're still on our devices so taking stimulation in in the afternoon we look for a snack maybe it's something sweet maybe it's something salty and by the time we get home and relax we end up eating more than we need. And maybe there's also some wine and chocolate that bookends that. I'm curious if anybody here resonates with aspects of this. Maybe the skipping meals, maybe the not stopping for lunch, maybe the big meal in the evening or looking for a snack in the afternoon. Or maybe you don't relate to this at all, which is great or different. And I also want you to notice the color on that screen. What color jumps out at you? 
It's pretty beige, right? And th thank you for sharing that. It's your exact day. You are definitely in the right place at the right time. So why is this not a good strategy? Okay, so as a dietitian, I could lecture for an hour. I'm not going to do that. All I'm going to do, because we're looking at energy. If you want good energy, you want to regulate your blood sugar levels, your blood glucose. If you eat like the slide I just shared, it is highly likely that your glucose levels are up and down and lots of fluctuations in between, which is not good because it releases hormones like insulin, it stores fat easier, it doesn't help digest your food efficiently, it deters your immune system, and it's not good for your gut. Also not good for your brain. That's why if any of us on the call have got kids who go to school, we understand the importance of them eating correctly to be able to concentrate. And we are just bigger children. We still have a brain. We also need to give our brain the best kind of feel to be able to concentrate. And I mean, we don't have playtime twice a day. We work much longer hours. It's even more important for us, you know. So this is a strategy that seems to work for most of us. I'm not suggesting that we all eat this way. But a lot of the research shows that if you follow this kind of strategy, you'll probably boost your energy. Um, if you are eating breakfast or having snacks and having lunch, can you see the difference in color? Much less beige, right? And more rainbow color. So there's a, a very important tip is bring in color. But color doesn't come from Skittles and wine gums or Smarties or M&Ms. Color comes from uh, fruits, plant-based foods, like, you know, um, vegetables, salads. That brings in lots of fiber, which is very good for your gut. And I'm going to mention that a little bit later. Also, to, bet, to choose the right carbohydrates, <clears throat> if you are choosing carbohydrates. So either using the glycemic index as a guide, low GI foods or high fiber carbohydrates. Balancing some plant proteins, uh, plant fats and proteins. So things like nuts and seeds and tahini. Um, if you want more information and recipes, please reach out to me. I've written a recipe book and I've got lots on my blog and my website. I wanted to, the main thing I wanted to mention was the color. And when you stop for lunch, to gift yourself 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to pop that into the chat, to have lunch. Because that's how long it takes for your stomach to stretch and release hormones to go up to your mind, to your brain and say, thank you, I've had enough to eat. And ideally, give yourself a little bit of break where you don't have any screens. Very important. And then in the afternoon, if you feel tired, to ask yourself two things. Am I well hydrated? So ha have I had enough water to drink? And enough water is 250 mils, so that's one glass, per 10 kilograms that you weigh. So if you're, you can't see my whole body, but I'm quite petite and short, so I would potentially weigh less than most people in, in, a, in a room. If you're maybe somebody who weighs 100 kilos, you would need more water than I would to hydrate. So that's a good guide is to use your body weight. And that's over and above regular tea and coffee because coffee is a diuretic. So if you are drinking coffee, I'd like you to put that over and above this. So right now, wherever, where, have you got water close by? Like, can you reach out like I can? I've got some herbal tea. So water or herbal tea counts as hydrating fluid. Anything that's got no caffeine and sugar in is, um, or alcohol, of course, is good for you. And also the other question to ask if your energy drops in the afternoon is, have I had sunshine? Have I had fresh air? Or how is my breathing? So how is your breathing? What's happened to your breath in the last 10 minutes or so? Oh, could you take, some of you were breathing slowly and deeply, which is fantastic. Those of you that maybe weren't, could you breathe a little bit deeper on your inhale, lengthen your exhale? Now, if you do this, if you bring in some color, if you hydrate, if you remember to breathe and maybe get some sunshine, spend time in nature, it makes it easier at the end of the day to make better choices. Because when we relax at the end of the day, that's generally when we feel we have those cravings for either alcohol or sugar or crisps or we're you know, in front of Netflix and we're so wired from the day that we don't know how to relax. And so we end up often eating or we're fidgety. So how we do our days will definitely help us into the evenings. And I'm going to highlight that when I go into sleep and what can help us to get a better night's rest. The key is to set up your environment as much as you can. 
So maybe do what I do is once a month, I order things online. I've got these boxes that arrive once a week with healthy recipes and easy quick meals. So in 20 meals, like last night, I was so tired and so hungry, but in 20 minutes, I had this like yummy fish curry thing going. I would never have made a fish curry, but because I got this box that arrives once a week, it actually saves me money because I don't waste food. I don't go out and buy ingredients that I end up throwing out. So prepare. That means maybe buying the right snacks, putting them into your environment. So some of you are going back into the office. If you're traveling, keeping it in your travel bag. If you're at home, stocking up your home and then remembering to stop and enjoy them. Yeah. And can you see the color on the slide again? So when I say eat like an artist and I say bring in more color, I mean from these foods, right? So I can't begin to explain how important it is to be eating an abundance of these kind of colorful plant-based foods. You want to have about eight servings of these foods per day. And a serving, I'm putting this into the chat, is a tennis ball size or a fistful. So you really want to try and bring those in. If you do that, one of the major benefits you will experience is a healthier gut microbiome. Now microbiome means tiny life, tiny life inside. If you've maybe got your hand still by your belly button, inside your belly, in your digestive tract, there are more species of bacteria than there are in the rainforest. They are so important to our well-being. Without them, you would not have an immune system. You would not be able to properly digest your food. You would not be able to absorb vitamin D, vitamin K. You wouldn't be able to break down fibers. Uh, you, you basically wouldn't be able to live. So having this bacteria, this microbiome, this universe of bacteria inside our digestive systems is very important. We often don't think about them until they go wrong. So if you've had maybe constipation or bloating or indigestion or candida or any kind of severe digestive issue, then we pay attention. However, there's so much when we help support our gut health, we support our overall well-being and especially our immunity. And that's important in the context of, um, well, not just COVID, any time. Here is a, a personal story, a very quick one. My mother... After they moved to South Africa, my parents, it was a bit of a shock for my mom. It was a bit stressful because she couldn't speak English and she thought she was on honeymoon, remember? <laughs> she thought she was going back to France and she has six brothers and sisters. My father, however, was an only child. So for him, it was easier to make the transition and to stay in this new country. So my mom developed um, a skin condition, a very severe psoriasis. And whenever she was particularly stressed, her gut, she would get constipation. Uh, and then her skin would be very bad. It would flare up. And it got to a point where it was really bad. It was coming up her neck, her forehead. She had scratching in her, her scalp. And she could not keep taking medicine for it because the corticosteroid was really bad for her liver and her kidneys. So she saw a doctor who asked her questions about what we're talking about today. How's your stress? How's your sleep? How's your anxiety? How's your diet? And they picked up that she wasn't eating nearly enough colorful foods and that her microbiome was maybe imbalanced. Your microbiome gets imbalanced because of antibiotics, painkillers, caffeine, alcohol, and stress. Some of us have all five of those every week. So it is possible and likely that your microbiome might not be at its healthiest. And so what she did was she ate a lot more colorful foods and she did a little bit of mindfulness because my mom's a very anxious kind of individual. She can't sit still. And she trained herself to sit still for five or 10 minutes a day. And after four months, her constipation went away, her skin cleared, and she has never taken that corticosteroid treatment again. And it's been about, I don't know, seven years. And this was her last year during lockdown. I was on the phone with her. I don't, you can maybe see my little face on the screen there. Um, it was her birthday and uh, we were having a chat and these flowers that I had bought ar arrived during our chat. So I was crying. I was so overjoyed. <laughs> and why I show you this picture is not just to show you that like seven years on she's managing her skin, but also what is she eating? That's not very colorful, right? It's a croissant, some kind of biscuit. 
And this is important. This is the 80-20 principle. So 80% of the time, if you do what's right for you, so my mom does what's right for her. You know, she, she takes a probiotic, she eats the right kind of foods, colorful, balances her plant fats, does the mindfulness, but 20% of the time she doesn't. And that's okay. The, the issue is that most of us are not doing 80-20, we're doing like 50-50, which is why we don't get great results. So what have we covered so far? We've looked at strategic refueling, eating like an artist, so having lots of color to help your gut especially, being mindful when you eat, so actually giving yourself the gift of stopping to enjoy your food, and we've touched on hydration. Now, how do you know if all of this is working for you? Because we are unique. I mentioned that at the start. I mentioned that we have a unique blueprint. Uh, well, it's important to know your health numbers. And what do I mean by health numbers? Does anybody here on the call, are you checking anything around your health? Like specifically your cholesterol, uh, your blood sugar is important to check. If you have history of hypertension in the family, it's also important to check your blood pressure. And then there's things like, um, we can also check our vitamin and mineral levels, like vitamin D or magnesium. Is anybody, pop that into the chat if you're checking anything. And if you're like, oh my God, I have no idea. I have never done any kind of test. Maybe you can pop a no into the chat. Because this is a bit like when you have a car, I know like, here in the UK, we have to do an annual MOT. I'm sure that wherever you live, you need to check if everything's okay, the oil's okay, the fuel's okay, if it's roadworthy. And we don't often check if we are roadworthy. And by doing some of these tests, and you, for many of these tests, you don't even need to go see your doctor. In many parts of the world, you can order um, testing kits online. And even if you just do it once a year, uh, it's such a good investment in your health and well-being to know if the vitamins you're taking are actually being absorbed, for instance, or to be conscious of potentially when things are imbalanced. Thank you so much for the sharing in, in the chat. Um, oh, and if you are scared of blood tests, yeah, I must say, um, that's a hard one. Unless you are maybe comfortable to do just the little finger prick, um, but that does make it a bit of a chat challenge. I would then say that maybe you do some mindfulness exercises that help you switch your thought of the blood tests. Um, but very good. There's somebody that's not checking, but trying to balance blood sugar. That's great. Why these things are good is they can really help you have a personal health plan. So like, for instance, I was taking vitamin D and thought it was working until last year. This time I had seasonal affective disorder. I was not feeling great. I was really down. I had some lingering like depression, a bit of anxiety. I was wired and tired. I had night sweats. I actually thought I was going into menopause. I was like, this is not good. And I did a few tests and I picked up that my, my vitamin D was very, very low. And so was my magnesium. And so I switched the brand I was using and now it's been absorbed. And I would never have known that, you know. I also, by the way, started getting outdoors earlier in the day to see natural light. I need to see natural light to help the melatonin and the serotonin production in my brain. So wherever you live, if you're able to, first thing in the morning, get even just five or ten minutes of fresh air and see the sky outside of a room, outside of being indoors can be very helpful. Right, what I'd like to do now is we are going to have an opportunity to share what's working well and what, based on what I've shared, do you think you could potentially improve? And to do this, we're going to have an opportunity to go into a breakout room for four minutes. Or I like to call them breakthrough rooms because um, the wisdom often comes from the room. So I'm going to create a few small rooms and it's an opportunity for you to meet um, if for some reason you can't or you don't want to go into a room, you can always stay here with me. You can either speak to me or not. And we will be back in four minutes. So it's a quick share around what's going well. So please start off with the celebration. There's a reason why I do that psychologically. So what, what are you doing well? If there is something that you feel that you're doing well and where could you potentially improve? So you should have an invitation to a room 
if you end up in a room alone, just wait a few seconds. I'll make sure that somebody joins you. And I'll see you back shortly. Welcome to those coming back from the rooms. There's still others having chats, so uh, we're still waiting for them to come through the portal. And welcome if you just joined us. Oh, there you go. Hi in the chat. Yeah, welcome. So we've been chatting about uh, the first four, five points on the calculator, which I will revise at the end so you can go through it and score yourself. Uh, we've spoken about gut health and eating like an artist, hydration, um, knowing your health numbers so that you know that what you're doing is actually working. Excellent. Welcome back. So nice to see some cameras on. <laughs> I know it's not always ideal to do that. Right. Did you celebrate things? Did you maybe? maybe yes. We didn't have enough time. <laughs> Oh, is it too short? <laughs> we had to rush in the end, but it was okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we're going to have an opportunity for another breakout. So, yeah, I think it's important to know that we often uh, struggle with the same things. And sometimes we have answers for colleagues and people we care about uh, for things that they might want to change. So maybe you manage to drink water easily. So the way you do that can maybe help somebody who's like, I'm struggling with hydration. Right. So let's go into a very important question on the calculator. Are you getting enough sleep? Maybe quickly answer that in the chat. Would you say that you're getting enough sleep or would you like more sleep or better sleep? So yes, if you're doing great and no, if you're not doing great around your sleep. Most days, yes, yes, not enough. Could be better. Okay, because this next section is going to help you not just with sleep, but with rest in general, which is an important part of the program around managing our energy and our well-being. Um, and the format, the framework that I like to use for this, once again, is nature. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of common theme here around the importance of nature, right? Is if you take the seasons, so spring, summer, autumn or fall, all and winter and you overlap them onto a 24-hour day spring will be the early morning that's as you wake up so when you become conscious maybe your alarm's gone off maybe the dogs bark maybe uh, your little cherub has come into the room to wake you up you're now awake summer starts and spring ends the moment you may be in the stress response which means you pick up your phone and you look at work emails or WhatsApps or Slack messages or you go onto social media or you put on the television and listen to the news or you have the radio. Anything that might then tell you, oh, there's bad news or here's something to worry about or here's something that I need your help with. That's when you go into summer and then that is your work day. Then at the end of your work day, we should have a period of time where like autumn, we slow down. You know, autumn is when the leaves start to fall and the days start to get shorter. And we need to also allow ourselves to drop down to prepare for going into winter, which is when we're in bed and we want to sleep. So let's start at the beginning of the day. How do you wake up? How long is your spring? Remember that spring is as you awake, when you're maybe still lying in bed, perhaps even remembering a dream to when you maybe reach for your phone. So maybe pop into the chat. How long was your spring this morning? So I know we're at different times of the day, but all of us have woken up and we've arrived at this call. How long was your spring? So mine this morning was 45 minutes, which is a bit shorter than I like it to be. But sometimes it can be three minutes or one minute, depending on how quickly we actually engage with our phone. So, so far we have half an hour, 25 minutes. The reason why I bring this up is when you wake up from sleep, even if you've had a bad night's sleep, you, you are probably the most relaxed and rested. Your nervous system will be the most relaxed it is 
in the whole day. So the longer you can stay in that, remember the word on that slide was parasympathetic, the rest and digest. You give yourself the opportunity not only to heal and digest, but also to connect with yourself. Because a lot of us, we don't take the time to truly know how we're feeling. And then we're maybe engaging with others. And then we have to put on masks and act a certain way. Or maybe we see something that upsets us. But had we not seen that, we would not have been upset. Um, and this can be exhausting. This is where we start to drain our batteries and we start going into that fight or flight response. And we potentially don't create a space for us to really make the most out of our day. Um, and one of my colleagues, uh, she's a speaker and author, a brilliant lady called Esther Perel, speaks about how through the pandemic, we've lost a lot of this Eros energy and by Eros energy, uh, she means life force. So the ability to be spontaneous and creative and playful and serendipity and allow for imagination. We've lost that because it, it was dangerous to be spontaneous and playful. Like we had to stay away from doing things and be very almost like locked up. And she's saying how she's seeing in her clients and patients this, this almost this deadness, this apathy, this loss of conviviality, right? So one way to cultivate that is to give yourself space in the morning to really connect with yourself, to maybe take a little bit longer, because once you get into your day, you will get pulled into your day. You'll be a busy bee, right? So is there a way that in the morning you could make a little bit more space and time for you? I know it's not always easy if you have kids and responsibilities, but could you bring in maybe just five minutes where you could sit at a window with a cup of tea or maybe read a book that you never read. Do something that gives you a sense of joy and pleasure that increases that Eros energy inside you, that life force. Because before you know it, you're going to be into your day. Um, you're going to have demands on you. Your battery is going to come down. Your mental energy, your emotional energy, your physical energy is going to start to drain. Um, we have never, ever been as still behind screens as we are now. We are so sed sedentary. We sit for too long and we're doing so much more work like this, right? And this is going to continue. This is the new normal. Even though we're looking at each other, we don't have eye contact. You know, I'm staring into the Logitech webcam light, imagining a human behind there, but I can't really see you. You can't really see my nonverbal cues and pick up on like my e energy. And that this is very exhausting for both of us. The brain is constantly trying to make a connection, make a connection, make a connection. And in between this, you've got emails and proposals and clients and your own personal life. So it's exhausting. So here are some tips to help. I hope that you're doing all three of these. And if you're not, that maybe this is your personal pledge to do one, one of these. When you're spending lots of time behind your screen, every 20 minutes, I'd like you to look 20 meters or 20 feet away uh, for 20 seconds. So maybe do that now. Look away from the screen. Don't look at me. And look as far as you can. If you've got a window, look out the window. If you need to look behind you to look to the corner of the room because maybe you've got a wall in front of you, like look away and blink your eyes a bit. And take two or three slow, deep breaths. Because if you're breathing, you know, for six six seconds or so, or eight seconds per breath, that's about 20 seconds. So take two or slow, deep breaths. Blink your eyes. This helps with eye strain. Then come back to the screen. Now, you haven't adjourned this meeting. You haven't left your desk. But you've given yourself a little bit of a break. And I'd like to encourage you to do that two or three times an hour. Because if we sit still like this and we get stressed, we clench our jaw, we hunch our shoulders, we hold our breath, we lean forward, we cross over our legs, we get all constricted in our posture, we don't breathe properly. And that's why a lot of us have got so many aches and pains, you know. So another thing to do is to every hour, if you can, stretch. So I give you full permission right now to move around, swing your arms, lift them up, maybe stand, turn around. Just move a bit. Uh, motion shifts our emotion. 
very important part of helping us actually not get stuck in an emotion. If you're able to, and I know the culture within Pernod is amazing, because like today, this meeting will end five minutes before the um, half hour. And that's great. I can't tell you how few people are doing that. We need to give ourselves space and time to breathe, to go to the bathroom, to have a sip of water. And the third one is please give yourself a, a break in the middle of your workday. If you're working for eight hours or 10 hours or maybe 12 or 14 hours, halfway, stop and stop for 20 minutes. And if you can, leave your phone face down for 20 minutes. And if that feels terrifying, start with two. Start with two, two minutes and build it up to five or 10. When you stop being stimulated by all these other things coming in, we allow the brain to fully work, to daydream, to create connections that we would not have thought about if we hadn't done that. And another tip is the mindful minute. So the one that we did at the start, if sometime in the middle of your day, you can just come back to your breath. Notice how your breathing is. Slow it down so that you can help your nervous system and keep your muscles relaxed. And that helps you show up at your best. You know, if you want to stop that spiral of getting tense and tired and exhausted and then overeating and just crashing in front of Netflix at night and not having energy potentially to exercise or to do other exciting things, we need to stop that. And you can. We have much more control than we realize. Especially when we look at things like a mindful minute. Everyone has a minute. We might not have a half an hour, but we have a minute. And we can choose how we are while we're working. Like as we show up right now in this presentation, choosing to stretch or relax or uh, keep slow, deep breaths. And if you do that, it makes it easier when you get to the end of the day to wind down. And this wind down is not an easy thing to do. I know, especially if you're working from home, right? The lines are very blurred between work and personal life. You know, we don't, we, we don't work at home. We live at work sometimes. Or we work with home. I mean, on the call earlier, I saw there was a lovely little, little one that ran up to somebody. You know, we've got all things go, going on. So at the end of the day, to switch off, like when we're working in the office, it might be a bit easier because we leave, we close our computers, we say goodbye to colleagues, we commute, we walk through the front door. So there's lots of signals that, hey, I'm slowing down. So how can you create signals to help you slow down? And this is where we need to be creative. Because let's say you're working at home and you're working off your dining room table. A very simple ritual like wiping the dining room table clean at the end of the day can become a powerful statement of I've ended my work day. So it doesn't have to be big dramatic things. I change my clothes. So when I'm finished my day, I'll put on something else to wear. Even if I've been working at home and I haven't been client facing, um, I sometimes go outside so that I can walk through my front door. I've got a client who goes and she sits in her car for 10 minutes because she said, well, I would have commuted for over an hour anyway. So she does that and then she comes back into her home. What this means is we need boundaries. You know, we need to be able to say, this is, this is how I'm going to look after me. And those boundaries are important and they're not always easy to put in place, right? It means saying yes and saying no to things. So for instance, if you look at this picture, what word would you use to describe the gentleman on the left? What word would you use? Might be tired, overwhelmed, fatigued, exhausted, stressed to the max. Yeah, so you almost want to tell him it's okay, you've done enough. Now we need to tell ourselves that we've done enough because there'll always be work to do. There'll always be emails, always be emails. Oh gosh, always be people to contact, articles to read, stuff to do. We need to be able to say, I've done enough. And then like the lady uh, on the right, potentially, yes, yes to going outside. Yes to catching the, the setting sun. Yes to me and my self-care and maintaining my sense of conviviality. So being able to say no and yes to the right things is an important part of slowing down at the end of the day. 
and giving our tired hearts the permission to heal. And maybe it can be as simple as, you know, what I've been doing recently is using music to change my state. So at the end of the day, I'll sit and listen to one song. And now that I'm listening to the same song over and over, it helps me to relax. Likewise, sometimes in the morning when I wake up and I'm like, oh, I don't feel so vibey today, but I've got a presentation or I want to feel more energized. I then listen to other music. So I've been doing that. That's something I never used to do in the past. So if you stay curious, you'll stay more open minded and these opportunities and ideas will come to you. The challenge is when we're constantly, constantly attached to these devices. And there's always Instagram and TikTok and emails and proposals and work and LinkedIn and so much, so much chatter to be uh, involved and connected to. But it disconnects us from ourselves and from nature and from potentially other people. So maybe for you, it's about thinking, yeah, what could I do at the end of my day to bring in more rituals that will help me relax more? And it doesn't have to be long. It can be as long as a song. Um, it can be a half an hour walk, sure, uh, but it can be a three minute cup of tea where you just let the day sink. The way we're working has changed, so the way we approach our well-being has to change. And we need to become a lot more creative, especially when we're working and living and eating and entertaining and doing everything in the same space. Laundry, you know, hospitality, uh, all those things. And then when we get to bed and put our heads on the pillow, you're more likely to fall into a deep restful sleep if you've given your nervous system a little bit of a break during the day. That's why it's important to do the mindful minute, to focus on your breathing, to stopping for lunch, to taking little breaks from your screen. And then for those of you that are struggling with sleep, there's a brilliant TED talk by... Um, Matthew Walker, that if you haven't watched, is exceptional. And his book is great, you know, about why we sleep. You know, things like the temperature. It's much better to have a colder room for most of us. Very dark. I use earplugs, which I never used to use, and they help a lot. Um, the texture of your linen and how you feel in your bedroom is important. If you're working in your bedroom, to um, definitely pack things away so that you're not going to bed thinking about work. So there's lots of things that you can do at night. And also, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, that could be because you've got lots of cortisol in your system. Uh, then if you've practiced mindfulness breathing techniques, you will be more likely to use them then. But if you've not practiced them, you're not going to actually use them, right? Yeah, we need to practice things. It's a bit like being an athlete. Um, you can't just go and do the big event. You need to actually have trained. So getting enough sleep, having mindfulness in your day, that can be meditation. It can be five minutes of sitting still with a cup of tea. It can be a walk in nature. It's where you allow yourself to not be on your other screens, to be with yourself and to connect with how you're feeling in the present moment with a sense of gratitude or acceptance or kindness. That's really important. Um, and I think when you're working with Pernod Ricard and there's this whole culture of conviviality, it's really lovely to maybe think about how can I have my own moments of conviviality? I do that through gratitude. So I've got a gratitude journal and in the morning I write in it or the end of the day, depending on what time of day is best. So how could you bring in a bit more mindfulness into your day? And another thing that's really important, which we've already addressed, is movement. We need to activate and move our body during the workday. And we also need to do intentional exercise because that helps us with staying fit, um, keeping endorphins flowing. Those are like antidepressants for your brain. Uh, helps to also keep us flexible. So it's important to also do some kind of stretching. The key is to try and do half an hour of exercise that gets your heart rate up on most days of the week and enjoy your exercise. So for instance, I really love dancing. So I do salsa dancing and West Coast swing. And I really miss that when we had lockdown. Oh my gosh, I realized how much it meant to me. So now I go as often as I can. 
um, and I stopped running. I used to be a runner and I just didn't enjoy it. And I'm like, no, life's too short to do exercise that I don't enjoy. So find exercise that you enjoy and remember to do that. And then the last point on the world calculator, which we've spoken about right at the beginning, is do you know when your body is responding to stress? And have you got techniques to help you manage that? So when I, why this is so important is because the body responds to stress before your conscious mind does. I mentioned that, for instance, your breath will change. I notice that when I'm stressed, I might bite my nails or I clench my jaw. So if I'm clenching my jaw, I know that something's causing me to feel stress. So if you pay attention to how your body is, you can get lots of information about your stress response. I took this photograph at the end of 2019. I was on a wine farm in Cape Town. And why I took it is you can beautifully see the roses at the end of each row of vines. And of course, you know, uh, with Pernod Ricard, you'll understand that wine is a big part, is, is important. And uh, you know how much I love Champagne and my family are from the Champagne region in France. Some of you may know, why are the roses there? I mean, they look beautiful, but that would be a very expensive exercise. The roses are there at the end of each row of vines because the roses will get affected by a certain bug or a mildew before the vine does. So the roses become an alarm system. They can alert the vineyard manager to, hey, something is wrong. I need to pay attention to the soil or something's going on. Because if you don't pay attention, then you could potentially lose the whole crop, which is devastating. What are your roses? What is your alarm system? How do you know when stress is starting to get the better of you? Because a little bit of stress is okay. It's actually very good and important. It gets us up and going. However, it's when it's too much that we create that overwhelm and we start leaning towards burnout. And often the physical body will tell us a lot of clues around stress. So there's many other things we can look for emotionally and mentally, but I, I don't want to get onto that. I wanted you to really be aware of your breath and your musculature, how your muscles are, can give you a lot of information around whether you're stressed. So how do we put this all together? Because now we're coming towards the end of our journey, right? We've been through the well calculator. What I'd like us to do is I'm going to remind you of what we've been through and I want you to score yourself. So as I go through each point that we discussed, I want you to give yourself one point if you answer yes. So if you do that 80% of the time, give yourself one point. And if you answer no, no point. So firstly, do you have a strategy around the way that you refuel? So are you eating in a way that helps sustain your blood glucose levels, so keeps your energy levels up, so that you can feel like your own chief energy officer? Yes or no? Uh, if it's only 60% of the time or 50% of the time, then it's a no. Zero. If it's a yes, 80% of the time I do that, then one point. Do you eat like an artist? Are you eating eight servings of those colorful foods, plant-based foods on most days of the week? And remember, that is very important for your gut health. So yes or no? Yes, one point. No, no point. Would you say that you're a mindful eater? So most of your meals, do you actually stop, stop and eat? <laughs> As opposed to being distracted and maybe eating on the run. I know that sometimes we need to do that. I do that. But most of the time, do you give yourself the ability to stop and eat mindfully? Do you hydrate? So are you having one glass of water or herbal tea for every 10 kilograms that you weigh? Do you know your health numbers? So as a minimum, are you checking things like your blood glucose once a year, maybe your cholesterol? If you're taking vitamins and supplements, please check that they're actually being absorbed. Number six, are you getting enough rest? And number seven, do you have some kind of mindfulness practice? Now remember to help us with number six and seven, I took you through the seasons as a framework. So mindfulness can be how you start your day. Maybe in the morning you do prayer or reading or gratitude or some yoga. That counts as mindfulness. As long as you're doing it with a sense of being present, 
you know, not being too anxious about the past or the future, and with a sense of kindness and gratitude, that feeling good is very important. Um, and then we looked at how you take strategic rest during your day, um, also how you wind down at the end of the day and bring in some opportunities for rest there. And that can really help a lot to make you get better night's sleep. More quantity and more quality. And then number eight, are you activating and moving your body during the workday as a minimum, getting up and stretching every hour? Like that is a minimum. If you can sit and stand and alternating between walking and talking, very important because I explained how exhausting it is when we keep staring at each other on screens where we're not really making connection and the brain and the nervous system is trying to do that. And then are you doing intentional exercise? Enough for you to stay as fit as you want to, but also flexibility. You know, it's important to include stretching, not just to do like running and cycling. And then number 10, do you know what your roses are? What is, do you know what happens in your body when you are stressed? And have you got at least one technique that you can do in the moment to help you relax? So one of the examples was the mindful minute, for instance. There's many others, but for now, I'd rather us have one thing and you do that well than too many things. What is your score on the well calculator today? I know that it can fluctuate, but if you're happy to share in the chat, what is your score out of 10 on the well calculator? The average score, by the way, is usually uh, four or five. So if you're doing more than five, we've got somebody's got seven out of 10. Great, four. That's average, one, seven. What do you think the ideal score is? Six. So the ideal score is 10. Because remember, I said you we don't need to do everything perfectly all the time, but 80% of the time. So even if you have a score of seven or eight, if let's say you answered no to the sleep one and managing stress, those are big things, right? So it's not that a, a higher score is better. It's just, I guess, more indicative of your holistic approach to your well-being. And if you've got a score of one, I think that's good news because you've got lots of opportunities to potentially shift it. But now, how you shift your score is important because you cannot and shouldn't go from a score of one or a score of four to 10 out of 10. You want to set yourself up for success. And the way that you set yourself up for success is you start by doing something very small. So start by doing what is necessary. And then as you build on that, consistency over intensity, then before you know it, you're actually doing lots of good things. So how do you do that? The recipe I like to use is from a professor called BJ Fogg, and he wrote a book, Tiny Habits. He's based at Stanford University. And he says that if you're going to start a new behavior, let's say you want to drink more water or eat more colorful foods or start a mindfulness practice, you must make it so tiny, so tiny that it's ridiculously easy, that you have a 100% chance of doing it. Then you attach it to an anchor to something that will nudge you or prompt you to do it. An example, let's say you want to drink more water. Your goal will be, I'm going to have one glass of water with my morning coffee. I'm not gonna have eight glasses of water. No, 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 that's not one glass of water with my morning coffee. And then when you do that, is while you're drinking the water, feel good. So celebrate. That helps your brain release dopamine, which tells you to redo that behavior. So we change most when we feel good, not bad. So, and celebration is not a big thing. It's not like you're throwing a big party. You're literally just smiling to yourself, giving yourself a thumbs up. And maybe, you know, if you want to, you can go, yeah, well done, you know, and say it out loud, but you can't always do that. Let's say, you know, you're doing a mindful minute and you're in a meeting with a colleague acknowledge that you've done it. It just takes a few seconds and then you can get that chemical change in your brain which will help you to come back to doing that behavior. So what is your tiny habit going to be? Based on our chat today, 
What do you feel is something that you can do and how can you make it super tiny, super tiny, super tiny, ridiculously achievable? So if you don't have a mindfulness practice, don't start doing 10 minutes a day. That's too much. Start with one minute, but be very clear on when you're going to do it. When are you going to anchor that into your lifestyle? Because when we create new behaviors, it's like planting a seed. And when you plant a seed, it doesn't just grow. It needs water and sunshine. So you need to be able to feed it and it needs to have a particular place to grow the soil. Where is it going to be in your diary, your busy diary? Are you going to put a post-it note on your mirror that says gratitude? So every time you brush your teeth, you think of one thing that you're grateful for. Are you going to set an alarm or maybe find an accountability partner? We don't have to do this alone. Let's have another last breakout room session. They will be short. Um, and I'd like you to share with each other what you feel your one tiny habit could be. So what will your one tiny habit be? And then we'll come back and I'll share with you how we can see each other one more time in order to sustain motivation. Um, so I'm hoping that they'll be randomized. There we go. Everybody should have an invitation to go into a breakthrough room. And I'll see you back in a, in a couple of minutes. Just waiting a moment for everybody to come back from the breakthrough rooms. They've still got about 30 seconds or so. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Now, I would like to encourage you. We have an opportunity to come together in about, I think it's two weeks time. Phoebe will share the link. It's a check-in session where based on your tiny habit that you're committing to today that you've just potentially shared or maybe you've got a better idea because somebody else had a better idea. To, that's the one thing you take from our time together and that's what you do. Nothing else. And then please come to the check-in session and for half an hour we'll be able to share what's gone right and celebrate it, what's gone wrong, what are the challenges and we can relook and perhaps do one or two extra embodied exercises to help us with our nervous systems and better managing stress. And if you'd like to reach out to me, um, I'm happy to share the slides. The presentation has been recorded. You can find me on social media. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for putting you first and for being here with your attention and your energy. And um, I really hope that you're able to find more moments of conviviality when it comes to your well-being. Thank you, Phoebe, as well. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Celine, for everything that you've talked us through today. It's been brilliant. I think I can speak for, for everyone when I say that that was so impactful, just as it has been every single time you've, you've managed to do these sessions for us. And I think that the steps will be really, really actionable. You know, we take them step by step and hopefully next time we come together, we'll have uh, something to celebrate all together. So those sessions are now in your diaries. Um, you've either got the option of the 24th of February or the 2nd of March. So if you look out in your calendar, they should be there. But yeah, thank you again so much, Celine. And yeah, good luck to everyone with all of your pledges. Yeah. And feel free to create a hashtag Wellculator if you want to use that in chatter and yeah, connect with each other. Hope you have a great rest of your day, wherever you might be on this beautiful planet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.